Scripture reading is Hebrews 11, verse 7, the King James Version. Please stand. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. You may be seated. Testing one, two. Let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath again to everyone. It's an absolute privilege to be here with you all, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity that we get to study the wonderful words of life together and to really receive uh, what heaven wants to give. We concluded last week our series on Lord Teach Us, where we were talking about Lord Teach Us how to pray, teach us how to study, teach us how to witness. And um, I believe that God imparted much light to us, things for us to consider. We are now beginning um, a new series where we're really dealing with Lord, save our homes. Lord, save our homes. And uh, this is something very near and dear to my heart. I believe there's something in these messages for all of us. And my prayer is that by God's grace, we will receive the truth as it is in Jesus. And as a result of beholding him in even a more deep manner, we will become changed into the same image. So as we prepare to go into our study, I'm going to have another word of prayer, and I'm going to kneel. Uh, you don't have to kneel, but if you'd like to, you can kneel with me. But let us all pray together as we prepare our hearts to receive what heaven wants to give. Our loving Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for once again giving us this privilege to study your wonderful words of life. And Lord, we're very grateful for these opportunities that we get to affirm ourselves in the word and to be able to walk in the light as Christ is in that light. And so, Lord, I just pray that you might bless us in a very special way and bring healing, especially to the homes that need it most. Guide our minds and grant us wisdom beyond our years and forgive us, we pray, of our sins we ask, for we do ask it all in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. You know, um, if there's one thing that's very clear to me is, you know, I, I've said this in several sermons throughout the many years that I've been privileged to speak for the Lord. And one of the things that's really heavy on my heart is to remind people of what God has already said. There is an agenda Sadly, it, even, it not only exists in the world, but in a strange way, it exists even in the church. And there is this agenda to forget God. There's an agenda to just forget him, to just kind of put him aside. And people are living to what they feel and what they are impressed with. And the emotions that are governing over their thought patterns and their decision making and it's leading us into absolute turmoil. If you ever studied the book of Judges, the very last verse in the book says that the people, there was no king, and the people did that which was right in their own eyes. And it led the nation into absolute turmoil. I am convinced that one of the hardest verses in the Bible to actually believe, we quote it, we intellectually acknowledge it, but I believe that there is a tremendous struggle in believing it is Jeremiah 17. Let's go there. Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. In Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, I think this is one of the hardest verses for us as human beings to believe because if we really believed it, then I think that a lot would be different in our lives and it would be for the better. In the, in the book of Jeremiah, we're looking at this 17th chapter. When you get to Jeremiah 17, just let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, we're considering the ninth verse. And I think that this is a text of scripture that's very hard 
for many of us to believe, but there's a lot of blessings and safety once we're convinced that what God says right here is true. It's in verse 9. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the heart, which is interpreted in the Hebrew, the mind. It says the mind is deceitful above all things. And then it says it's not just wicked. It says and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? If we really were convinced that God is right, that God means what he says here, because this is a very general statement that applies to all of humanity. When we say things like, well, God knows my heart, I would say, I agree. He knows our heart so well, he wrote about it. And we just read it. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And the truth of the matter is, is that if you and I live long enough, we can see and remember times, did not your heart deceive you? Can't you look back? All you need is a little bit of life experiences. And weren't there some times we thought everything was all right just to find out it was all wrong? You know, Solomon, the wise man, echoed this principle in Jeremiah 17 in Proverbs 14. Let's turn there. In Proverbs, the 14th chapter, you will find that Solomon also brought this point out as well. It's like God is really trying to convince us as his people that he means what he says. And you and I would do well to cease living by impressions. Remember, the devil can impress an individual. You can't let impressions be the thing that guides your decision patterns. You and I cannot allow our feelings to guide our decision patterns. Our feelings are like the wind. One minute is here, the next minute is gone. And here it is that the Bible lets us know in Proverbs 14 now, we're looking at verse 12. Notice what it says in Proverbs 14 and verse 12. This is echoing the principle we just read in Jeremiah 17. It says, there is a way which seems right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. Death. You know, I've learned that Jesus, it, there was so much love in Jesus' heart when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was actually a message of love. Did you know that? He was trying to spare us from being subject to that desperately wicked nature that we all have, that desperately wicked natural way of thinking and deciding. And when I look at our world today, it, 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 it moves me so much to say, man, we really got to be about our father's business because the world is trying to remove God and think that they got it all figured out. And look at where we are in society today. We are at the height of confusion. Now, if there's one area specifically that we're focusing on, it's going to be in the area of marriage. God had a plan when he put marriage together. There was a purpose of why God gave marriage. And it often is overlooked for the many reasons people get married. Today we got people who get married because they're lonely. I don't read that in the Bible. The Bible says Adam was alone. It did not say he was lonely. Alone is a physical condition. Lonely is an emotional condition. I could be in a room filled with people and still be lonely. That is not a reason to get married. But that's the reason why a lot of people do it. Individuals can't control their loins, so they say, well, it's better to get married so I don't have to burn in hell. They misinterpret what Paul was trying to communicate in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And they pervert the gift of marriage just so they can fulfill their lusts of the flesh. And the list goes on. People get married for all sorts of reasons, but the real question is, what was God's purpose of marriage? When God created marriage, because that's how the home begins. I was with a group of youth, my beloved young brothers and sisters, and boy, did I shock them this week. It was fun. We were having Bible study, and, you know, they like talking about all the taboo stuff, so we got into a little discussion about S-E-X. And I remember that I told them, and I, I said, you know, I, it, it was like the Holy Spirit put it in my mind, and I said, oh, I like that. I said, I'm going to do that to them. I said, hey, guys, I said, did you know that God did not create sex for men and women? 
and you should have seen the look they gave me. I mean, they looked at me like I had two heads and 14 eyes. They were looking at me like, what did you just say? I said, nope. I said, I'm telling you, the Bible teaches it. God did not make sex for men and women. And then one girl was like, so it was for men and men? I was like, absolutely not. They was like, was it women for women? No, 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 not for that either. And they said, well, Pastor Lemon, what are you, what are you saying? That's what they called me. And, and I said, well, I said, sex was not made for men and women. It was made for husbands and wives. And they said, oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's like they got it. They got it clear as day. And I was like, very good. I said, it was made for husbands and wives. And then from that union, this is where we get children, which ultimately we have something today we call the family. But what was God's purpose when he set up marriage? What was God's purpose when he set up the family? I believe that the Bible does not leave us aloof to this question. All we have to do is go right back to the beginning. Do you know that that's what Jesus did? Remember in Matthew 19, when the Pharisees came to Christ and they said, well, Moses said we could put away our wives for this reason and that reason, but what do you say? And I love how Jesus answered. Jesus in Matthew 19, verses 1 through 4, you can read it for yourself in your spare time. Jesus answers and says, have you not read? The first thing he did was took them away from his opinion and brought them back to Scripture. He says, have you not read? And then you know what Jesus said next? He said that he which made them in the beginning, he took them right back to creation. Whenever you want to finally understand, this is a good message for the single people in the room. For the married people in the room, too late. The good news is, if you started out wrong, thank the Lord, you can make it right. But you are with the one you said I do too, like him or her or not. But to the young people and to the singles, hey, you got a chance. You got a chance to actually enjoy every bit of the one that ultimately you will end up with in holy matrimony. And so pay close attention. This is, I love this. This, this is a message that's good for the married couples and for the singles. Praise God. Now watch. In Genesis chapter 1, let's go to verses 26 and 27. Let's, let's understand God's perspective. If he's the creator, or shall I say, since he's the creator of marriage, it makes sense that we should go to him to understand what is its purpose. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, we're considering verses 26 and 27, and I want you to see what the Bible says as we look at the creation story. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, we're looking at verse 26, and it says, and God said, this is day 6, God said, let us make man in what? Our image and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. When God made mankind, male and female, the purpose was that we might be reflections of the very character of God. Are you following that? Simple. We were called to reflect the image and likeness of God, which summarize is his character. That's what we are to reflect. That's why you exist. When somebody says, why do you exist? What is your purpose in life every day? My answer is that I might reflect the character of God. Now, somebody may say, well, everybody has to do that. What's the purpose of your life? For some of us, I am called to reflect the character of God as a physician. I am called to reflect the character of God as a nurse. I am called to reflect the character of God as a business owner. It's like no matter what you do in life as it relates to specificity, always remember, you're not there to just collect the paycheck. You're there to reflect the image of God. Amen? Amen. Now, God is pretty serious about this because in Genesis 1, the beginning of time, God says the purpose of mankind, of why I created them, is to reflect my image and character. Did you know that in the last expression of the gospel, it's the same purpose? Go to Revelation 18. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, this is the last expression of the gospel. 
This is the last expression of the gospel to be given to the world. And I want you to notice the focus. Revelation, the 18th chapter. In the beginning of time, God makes it clear. I created mankind that he might reflect my character. And remember, it's not just reflect my doctrines. Are you following that? God says it's reflecting my what? Character. It's possible to believe the right things and be in a wrong standing with God in our characters. It is not here. I'm not trying to dumb down the importance of understanding right things. Certainly, we need to know truth. But what's way more important is letting the truth have its sanctifying effect on the heart, that I become a different person. You and I know this by now. It is possible to know right doctrine and still long after the things of the world, to reflect the character of Satan more than the character of God. This ought not be. So no, it is not merely just knowing right doctrine, even though that's an imperative. But what's most important is, does that doctrine that I believe is it having a sanctifying effect on my heart? Am I changing as an individual? Now, the Bible makes it clear that there's a group of people that's going to have the right doctrine, but they're going to also have the right character. How do we know? Revelation 18. In Revelation 18, right there in verses 1 and 2, I want you to notice what the Bible says. Again, this is the last prophetic gospel message that goes to all the world. It says, and after these things... I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his what? Glory or splendor. Now, we do need to understand glory, right? We need to understand splendor, so I'm going to tell it to you in a story. Children like stories. I learned adults like stories, too. Um, there's a story of a man. He was a friend of God. His name was Moses. Moses. Moses and God are friends, right? And you know how it is. When, you, when, when somebody's your friend, you do special things for them, right? Friends can ask for special favors, you know? If you're a stranger, you can't ask for special favors because if you go to somebody and say, hey, can you do this for me as a friend, I mean, as a stranger, if you say, hey, can you do this for me, that person has every right to look you up and down and say, do I know you? Uh, where do I know you from? Why would I do that for you? I don't know you, Right? But when you're a friend, oh, man, you can make all sorts of favors. You can say, hey, could you stop what you're doing and do this for me right now? And because we're friends, we'll go ahead and do that. Well, here it is that Moses, the Bible says, was God's friend. And you know what Moses did? He did what friends do. The Bible says in Exodus 33 and verse 18 that Moses went to his friend, God, and he said, Lord, I beseech you, I beg you, show me your glory, show me your splendor. Friends can ask those type of questions. And here it is that Moses asked God for that, and God responds. God responds in verse 19, and, and God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim my name. It's kind of like me saying, hey, Noah, please show me your car. And Noah says, no problem, I'll show you my Chevrolet. Are we talking about the same thing? Yes, but did we use the same verbiage? No, but we're talking about the same thing. It's the same thing that happened. Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God says, no problem. I'll show you my goodness and proclaim my name. They're talking about the same thing, but they're using different words. So what's the first lesson we learn? The glory of God, the goodness of God, and the name of God is synonymous. So in Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7, the Bible says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, even to the third and fourth generation. What did God reveal to Moses? His character. Those are character qualities. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Those are character qualities. So here we go. The glory of God is God's what? Character. So here goes Revelation 18 saying the last gospel message to go to all the world, it says the earth 
is going to be lightened up with God's glory or God's character. A lot of people are finally going to reflect the character of God. So the great purpose of why God created marriage, not just humankind, but also marriage, was that it might reflect ultimately his character. This is why you'll see this language in scripture a lot, like in Isaiah 54, 5 and 6. For thy maker is thine what? Husband. That's talking about God. God likens himself to a husband. It says, for thy maker is the husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the holy one of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Now watch verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Notice how God likens himself to a husband, and he likens the people to a wife. You see that? The purpose of marriage was that God might show himself, reflect himself so much in that union that something special would take place. Watch this. The Bible also says in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you or joined you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Notice again this language. God is the husband, Christ is the husband, the church is the bride, or it is the wife. One more. The Bible says, obviously, in Ephesians 5, and verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as who? Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, after the Bible in Ephesians 5 went through all of this husband-wife talk, talks about wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as uh, Christ loved the church. Paul summarizes this in verses 31 to 33, and here's what he says. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. In other words, he's summarizing why was he having all this husband-wife talk. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The marriage relationship was supposed to be a reflection of how God and the church are to be one. There's a whole lot of people who got married, and that was not their focus. Now, let's consider this. Not only the purpose of marriage, but what was the purpose of the family? Let's watch this now. Go back to Genesis 1. Now we're going to look at verse 28. In Genesis 1, you see, after God brought the union together, male and female, both of them reflecting the image and likeness of God, what does God say next now in Genesis 1 and verse 28? Let's consider it. In Genesis 1 now and verse 28, what is the purpose of the family? Well, let's go ahead and let's continue. In Genesis 1 and verse 28, the Bible says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them. Now, this them was especially dealing with the husband and the wife, okay? Okay who were to reflect the image of God and his likeness. God says to them, be fruitful and multiply and then do something very special. What was it that they were supposed to do? Replenish, if you use the King James, replenish is a horrible word. Yeah, the better, the better translation, the, the Hebrew word for replenish is to fill. You have no idea how many false doctrines have come out of the word replenish because it indicates that there was something existing before Adam and Eve. It's a bad word, okay? The better word is fill, all right? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, here's the question. Fill the earth with what? What do you think was on God's mind? Don't just fill the earth with human beings. Simply fill the earth with my character, with my glory, with my image. That was the whole purpose of being fruitful and multiplying. That's why every time I do marriage counseling, we don't just go over the book Adventist Home, we also go over the book Child Guidance. Because if there's one thing every married couple is going to do, is they're gonna to come together. 
And when they come together, then a child is going to be born. You don't want to start reading child guidance when you are starting to have children. You want to already know those teachings way before you have any children. And so every time I do marriage counseling, we don't just go over Adventist Home and many other books. We go over child guidance. We talk about parenting principles. Because like my wife and I, when my wife and I got married, we made the covenant. We were like, two years, and then we're going to have children. And two years turned into two months. <laughs> two months after we were married, my wife was like, honey, I got news. And then she said, I'm pregnant. And here it is, Jared is born. Six months later, my wife had the audacity to tell me I'm pregnant again. And then we had our beloved Kayla. And then six months later, my wife said, I'm pregnant. And then we had Caleb. I said, honey, could you please stop doing the six month deal? My wife followed through, and you know what? Five months later, <laughs> we had our last child, Jada. <laughs> My wife says, I've been pregnant for four years, you know, and it's true. And, and for us, we, we, we had to dive into child guidance in the middle of already learning parenthood, you know, because our counselor didn't go over these things with us. So there was bumps in the road. You know, we were kind of learning and going at the same time. It's a whole lot better to learn it ahead of time and then have the children, and then you can know what to put into practice. It's not that you won't make a mistake, but you'll make far less. Well, here it is that God makes it clear. The whole purpose of the family was to be a reflection of the character of God in that home as well. Well, this is why we have statements like this. God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to do what? Reveal himself to us. Do you see that? So I was doing some investigation. I said, huh, the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know. Now, it's easy to assume that must be the family. But then I just found a direct quote that just said it. The family is the closest, the most tender and sacred of any on earth. So literally, God created the family that God says, in the family, I'm making myself known. This is why, beloved, in summary, the purpose of marriage and the family is to aid each other in knowing God and his relation to his people. Then they are to reflect this love one to another and make it known in the world. I have two marriage counseling sessions coming up. And in these two marriage counseling sessions, the first question that I am going to ask these precious souls who are about to enter into holy matrimony, and this is a very serious question, and uh, I don't believe in giving what I think in, a mar in marriage counseling. I believe in giving God's counsels. Psalm 119 and verse 24 says, Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. The Bible is a counselor. So all true counselors, that, the counselors you can trust are the counselors that subject their counsels to the counselors. Are you following that? Those are the counselors you can trust. There's a lot of counselors out there that will abuse you. But the counselors, the counselors you can trust are the counselors whose counsel is according to the counselors. Are you following that? You know the first question I'm going to ask them? This is a statement and inspiration. Let's just say their name is John and Mary, just to keep it generic. I'm going to look John right in the eyes, and I'm going to say, John, you want to marry Mary, don't you? Oh, yes, Brother Lemon, I do. Mary, you want to marry John, don't you? Oh, yes, Brother Lemon, I do. Okay, John, okay, Mary, here's my first question to you. John, Mary, how will you make heaven more secure as a result of entering into a union with each other? Did you know that we were supposed to ask that? Did you know that before you get married, you were supposed to ask the question, how will he and how will she make heaven more secure for me? To make it more sure. To make it, as it were, almost guaranteed that as a result of being with you, you fix my mind so heavenward. You reflect the character of God so wonderfully that as a result of being with you, I am sure 
that I'll be counted amongst the saints in eternity. Did you know that that was a question that we were supposed to ask ourselves before we said, I do? And I think the statistics of divorce in not just the world, but the church testifies not many people ask that question. Like I told you, we got married, but we got married for all sorts of other reasons, rather than the focus of what God was trying to say. You can save yourself singles a lot of heartache if that man or that woman that you find, that you can say as a result of being with this person, this person makes heaven more guaranteed for me. That's how much they lift me up. This is my goal as a husband. I didn't enter into our marriage. 26 years we've been preciously married and I'm, I'm thankful for every single year, but I will tell you the truth. We did not start off right. We didn't know these truths like we know it now. And so I know that every day by the grace of God, I want to be such a wonderful reflection of the character of Christ that it actually makes my wife not just love me more, it makes her love Jesus more. You, you know you're on track when you're doing that, brothers. If you can love on your wife so much that she doesn't just simply talk about how great you are, but she talks about how great Jesus is, you are doing something right, and I would say to you, keep it up. But family, the truth of the matter is, is that when I think about that thief, right, Satan, go to John chapter 10, right? You remember, you remember what the Bible's very clear. It, you know, this, these things make it makes the Bible, it, I'm realizing the Bible's like a puzzle. And the more you put the pieces together, boy, do you understand the picture. I never looked at this verse with such clarity like I look at it now. In John chapter 10, it's in verse 10 that now I understand this much, much more clearly. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, you remember the, 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 from the creation story, God says, the purpose of me creating mankind and marriage was that they might be a reflection of me and my character, one toward another. And then they were to have children that they'll reflect my character to their children so the children will be reflections of my character. And then go have those children go marry other people and do the same thing. And they marry other people and do the same thing. And ultimately, the earth will be lightened with the glory of God. This was God's plan, okay? Now, Satan comes in the picture. Can't ignore him, right? It's detrimental to, at least. And I always wanted to know, what, what, what is Satan's whole goal in this, this, this game of life, this, this plan of salvation? What's his whole goal? John chapter 10. Look at what the Bible says. In John 10 and verse 10, look at how the verse starts, right? The what? The thief. Now, you know what a thief does. They steal. It says, the thief comes not, but for to do what? Steal and to kill and to do what else? Destroy. Stop right there. What is it that you believe Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy? The image of God in mankind. Every effort of Satan is summarized in that one act. Sat all of the satanic stuff we got going on in our world is to fulfill one purpose, to steal, kill, and destroy the image of God in humanity. Why do you think when you look at humanity today, look at everything that's being done, the devil is trying to erase God. It makes you look at a lot of the agitations that are happening in society in a much broader picture. The devil is on a serious game plan, and his game plan is erase the image of God in humanity. Get the people to forget God. So now God has an original plan for marriage. He says, I'm going to change that whole thing up. And it's not just simply gay marriage and things of that nature. But what about this, 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 this uh, stuff with the celebrities, open marriage? Well, you got husbands and wives that are doing talk shows, reality shows, talking about how they're sleeping with other people and how the husband and the wife is okay with it. Big name celebrities, that is glorified adultery. All of these things are perversions. They're all leading to one simple point. Erase God and his plan. Steal, kill, and destroy. So, it is not a wonder to me Satan's chief target 
Because the more that I think about the devil coming into the picture, I'm like, you know what? Satan's chief target, the number one thing that he wants to get rid of, and I want to I switch over to this. I'm going to move this one slide. It's not necessary, and I want to be preserving of our time. When I wa- Satan has one thing that he hates, right? One thing that he hates a lot, and it's called truth, okay? Satan hates the truth. Remember, Satan's introduction to bondage in our world came from a lie. Is that right? Is that right? That's how bondage came in. He lied and bondage followed. Okay? So now we're in a situation where Jesus comes along and what does he do? He tells the truth because the truth makes people what? Free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So when you study the Bible carefully, you will notice that Satan's goal is to erase the image of God by attacking the truth. Though as long as he can keep attacking the truth, attacking the truth, and questioning the truth. That's why he said, did God really say that? That's how he started his whole game. Did God really say that? I don't think he said that. You won't die. And he's been perpetuating that thing all throughout the ages. Now, Satan hates the truth. He wants to kill it. So one day I was looking at, you know, um, you know I used to... I used to be a, a man of war in different ways, uh, martial artist and all this other stuff. I'm not an advocate of these things today. Um, but, you know, it's like there was a time I used to be involved in combat on the regular. It was, it was part of my, my training and my lifestyle to a degree. And so I did learn some things about, you know, warfare and fighting and watching your enemy and, and these type of things. I did learn some things. And one of the things that's very important is you got to understand vital points. You know, like that was something that was big in martial arts. You know, they would always tell you, you know, hit people in vital points because if you hit them in the vital points, they can go down no matter how big they are or whatever the case may be. Assassins. An assassin doesn't shoot you in the arm. An assassin doesn't shoot you in the kneecap. Where, what does an assassin aim for? Vital organs, right? That's what you do. So I began to look at the, the attack method of Satan, and I found something. In Psalm 69 and verse 20, this is, this is what we call a messianic psalm, okay? A messianic psalm, obviously, a psalm talking about the Messiah, right? And Jesus, who is the truth, okay? Jesus, who is the truth, I want you to notice what Satan did. When Satan wanted to attack the truth as it was in Jesus, right? I want you to notice what he aimed for. And the Bible actually points it out. It points out the vital organ. Look at what it says in Psalm 69 and verse 20. It says, reproach hath broken my heart, okay? And I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. So when Satan wanted to throw his blow at Christ, what was the target? His heart. But what was the tool that Satan used? It says reproach. So I went and started searching the Bible. What does the word reproach mean? Proverbs 14 and verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So very simply put, the weapon, sin. The target, the heart. That's how Satan wanted to take Christ down. He used the weapon of sin, certainly not his own because Jesus was tempted in all points, but he never sinned, but he used our sins. Because of our sins, our Savior dies. And what was he aiming for? The heart. That's why when you read that little statement in Desire of Ages where it says it was not the thorns on his brow, it was not the the spear that pierced his side, our beloved Savior died of a broken heart. Satan says, that's what I attack. So you know what I began to do? I said, I wonder, what is the heart of the church? Because whatever's the heart of the church, that's where Satan aims all of his fiercest weapons. And for time's sake, I saw this. Society is composed of families and is what the heads of families make it. Quoting Proverbs 4 and verse 23, out of the heart are the issues of life and the heart 
of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. Satan is not afraid of a church that preaches well with broken homes. Satan's not afraid of a church like that because he knows that the heart is the lifeline. And if the heart, if the fountain is corrupt, everything else will be corrupt as well. And so it is in summary, Satan's number one target is the Christian home. That's his number one target. As long as the home remains broken, the community, nation, and church have no hope of fulfilling God's purpose, that great purpose of why God did it. And that's why he attacks the home. There are people today that are worshiping God and doing all sorts of things, and there are problems, very serious problems, in their marriage. And, and I get it. You know, we, we are, we are modern-day Pharisees, right? You know, the Pharisees in, 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 in Matthew 23, Jesus had a word for the Pharisees. The word was called hypocrites, right? And what that word hypocrite, it, 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 it drew me. I was like, what does that word mean? Like, what does it mean? I know, what, I know what I think a hypocrite is, but let me look. And I looked up the Greek word for hypocrite, and the Greek word for hypocrite is actor. Actor. God does not want us to come to church and act really well. He doesn't want us to get caught up into all this acting, this performance. I'm not here to say that you, would, you know, we're not going to become the church of Christ and all of a sudden you got to tell me all your sins. I'm not trying to tell you, I'm not, I'm not going there. But what I am saying is, is that you and I need to recognize that coming to church is more than just simply acting like we're something we're actually not acting like we feel a certain way we actually don't. When we are going through drama, God wants us to come to him and that he can help us to actually overcome it so we can really be who we are. We're told in inspiration, those who put Christ first, last, and best in their lives are the happiest people in the world. So I don't know if you remember when I would come up here and I'd say, happy Sabbath. And then I would ask a question and I would say, are you really happy? And the reason why is because I don't want you to get caught up into saying sentiments that are insincere. I don't want you, we already do that. We say laughing out loud and you know you wasn't laughing out loud, right? Well, somebody sends us a text and we'll be like, <laughs> and then we'll type laughing out loud. You weren't laughing out loud, right? We say this all the time. We say, I love peanut butter. And it's like, I mean, you don't love peanut butter. It's just, you enjoy the taste. But we, we, we take words and we use it in certain cases where it's not exactly what we're actually feeling. So we, we're living in a society that's kind of molding us to do that, to say stuff we don't really mean. So now, here it is. Now, when it comes to the religious realm, here we are like, you know, hey, I'm happy when you're not happy. And I'm depressed. And next thing you know, you hear about somebody killing themselves next week, and you just saw them last week, and they were like, yeah, I'm happy. That's why social media is deception of deceptions. People are just, you know, taking shots and selfies, and they're like, life's great. Next thing you know, you're finding out that they're hurting themselves, if not killing themselves. We're living in a society of insincere sentiments. God says when it comes to him, when it comes to church, don't be actors and actresses. God wants us to have a real, genuine experience. And so it is that the reality is, is that a lot of our families are hurting. The statistics are what they are. We're already told not one in 100 marriages results happily. That was the testimony of Jesus. That wasn't the opinion of a little old lady from the 1800s with a third grade education. That was a testimony of Jesus. Not one in 100 marriages are, hap are results happily. So we already know that a lot of us are in the wrong state. There are three types of marriages all beginning with the letter E. Three types of marriages, all beginning with the letter E. The first type of marriage is what's called enjoy. Are you enjoying each other? The second type of marriage is called endure. That's where a lot of marriages are. I endure him. I endure her. 
We're enduring. The Bible says we can't get divorced. Brothers especially, nope, can't leave my wife because if I leave her, I can't get married again. So they endure. The third type of marriage is called escape. Oh, Lord, I could leave. I know, I know, I know one lady. This was a special, wicked thing that she did. I mean, this is wicked. And she told us. She, 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 she actually told me she did it. I said that. I was like, that is wicked. That is just evil. She said, I withhold intimacy from my husband because I know his appetite. And I know that if I withhold from him long enough, he will cheat on me. And then when he cheats on me, she said, I will use the Bible and say, because you're the adulterous spouse, I can divorce you and get married again, and you cannot get married anymore. It was a plan, and it worked. He did it. He did it. And in my mind, I said, sister, if you think that you are going to be held guiltless before God, you are, you, Jeremiah 17, 9. You understand that? I said, sister, that's, that's a special kind of evil. She planned it. You understand that? And so there are people that are going through some nasty hurt, some nasty pain, and there's a lot of suffering. And you know what the Bible says? Luke 5 and verse 17. Let's take a look. In Luke 5 and verse 17, here's what the Bible says. And, and I, I especially, I give this verse when I do health lectures, but I also give this verse when we talk about marriage and the home. In Luke chapter 5, I love the close of verse 17. In Luke 5 and verse 17, here's what the Bible says. Praise God. I'm so thankful for this verse. In Luke 5 and verse 17, it says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And how does the verse close? And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Did you know that we just equated the home to the heart? Didn't we just do that? We saw that the home is the heart of the church, the heart of the community, the heart of the society. But didn't we just do that? Did you know that Jesus came to heal the broken heart? It's not just to heal those who are depressed. He came to heal broken homes. He came to take homes that are at a place of enduring and turn them into a place of enjoyment. And I want you to understand that even if our homes are messed up right now, even if our homes are troubled, 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 God says, once you get on my plan, the Lord says, I will turn your home into a little heaven on earth. And God will do it. He has more than enough healing power to get it done. This is why a necessary part of evangelism, according to the scripture, was always involving the home. I believe some of the most important departments in the church is health and temperance and family life. Those are some of the most important departments in the church. Why health and temperance? Because if you're my, the food we eat gets broken down to blood. The blood feeds our brain. Our brain houses our thoughts. Our thoughts is what ultimately produces our actions. Our actions repeated is what forms a habit. And our habits, along with our thoughts, is what's going to produce our characters. And our character is what determines our destiny. So that's the reason why it's very important to teach people how to eat right, how to drink right, and how to live right. That's the reason for last week's message. The reason we embrace health reform and medical missionary work is because the lifestyle we live affects our state of mind, which is going to affect that frontal lobe, which is going to affect your decisions that you make every day. That's why we live healthy. So I believe one of the most important departments we have, health and temperance. But family life, that's the foundation of the church. Broken homes, broken church. And I don't think God wants us to go evangelize and bring people into a realm of brokenness to just remain broken. God wants us to evangelize so we could do this. You saw earlier Noah was quoted by our scripture reading, right? I like what the Bible says about Noah. You know, 
I believe that when the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, while I understand that as it was in the days of Noah deals with the wicked, I get that, like as it was in the days of Noah deals with the wicked and, and a lot of bad stuff people are gonna do. But don't you also agree that as it was in the days of Noah, it means there should be some people like Noah? Amen? Yeah, I, I think that's the case, right? So I don't wanna be like the wicked antediluvians, I wanna be like my brother Noah. Now, the Bible told us something about Noah that I think we should pay attention to. Notice what it says. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So was grace in the Old Testament? Amen. But watch this. That grace produced works. What kind of works did it produce? Look at what it says. It says, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, God put that there as part of his explanation of why Noah is going to be allowed in the ark. Are you following that? Now watch. Here's what I thought was beautiful. And the Lord said unto Noah, come thou. But who else came with Noah? And all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. You see, Noah was not on a mission just to be just, perfect, and walk with God himself. Noah took those principles and handed it down to his family as well. That's why if you caught the scripture reading today, here's what it said again. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to what? the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah prioritized his home. Noah made sure, it's not about just me having a right walk. I need to make sure my beloved wife has a right walk. I need to make sure that my children have the right walk. Noah invested in his family. God challenges me and says, Dwayne, are you investing in your family. God challenges all of us today. Are you investing in your family? Now watch this. Did you know, look at all these verses. Luke 5, 25, and immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house doing what? Glorifying God. So when God healed the paralytic, the paralytic did not keep it to himself. The first mission field, the paralytic goes to his house and begins to glorify God. John 4 and verse 53, it says, So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his what? Whole house. Acts 18, verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Finally, Acts 16. And verse 31, the Bible says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Notice, the focus with God is always, once you receive the message, don't just run and go tell the world, run home and go tell your family. God's priority is the home. Now, what about Jesus? I like this statement. I thought that this was very powerful. In Luke 3, 21 to 23, watch what the Bible says. I thought that this was very interesting because all Jesus' life he was ministering. All Jesus' life he was ministering. But the Bible says something here that I thought was very profound. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. But then it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. So Jesus started his public ministry at 30 years old. So the real question is, this, this is the question. Oh, did something happen here? All right. Well, the question is, before the age of 30, where was Jesus serving? 
Because Jesus lived his whole life a servant. That's what Philippians 2 says. He lived his whole life a servant. So before the age of 30, where was Jesus serving? And the answer is very simple. He was serving in his home. I wonder if what would happen if we followed Jesus? What if, what if we focused more on learning how to serve and minister to each other in the home? And what if we could learn how to do it so well that it can only take three and a half years to finish the work? Think about that. It only took him. Jesus ministered so well in his home that by the age of 30, at 33 and a half, he said, it's finished. Christ entered into that most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary since 1844. It is 2023. Very soon to be 2024. What are we waiting for? Maybe there's something that's out of order that God wants to put back in order. Maybe there's something that Christ is trying to introduce to yours and my mind that says, I think, I know you love me, I know you're sincere, but maybe the focus is wrong. Many a homes I go into, beloved, many homes. And I cannot tell you how our people are thoroughly under attack. Thoroughly under attack. There are very few happy Adventist homes. Lots of endurance, lots of tolerating, nowhere near enough enjoying. The Bible says, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was what? Subject unto them. And the Bible says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Christ served in his home. He was subject, little children. He honored his father and his mother. He focused on how can I relieve them from their cares. He focused on how can I comfort them in their perplexities. He did everything possible to protect their reputation. Wow, what if we had children that operated like that? You know, they, even when nobody's looking, they know, people know who my father and my mother is. I want to guard their reputation. I don't want to do things that will cause people to have to go back to the parents and say, I saw your son and I saw your daughter doing some pretty shameful stuff. Did you know that it was part of the duty, in God's mind, part of the duty of a child was to protect, to guard the reputation of their parents, that no one would not only have nothing negative to say about them, but would not have anything negative to say about their mom and dads. Jesus lived like that. Now, the Bible lets us know in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, it was a prophecy. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite thee with a curse. It was not Elijah the actual person, but it was those who would work in the spirit and power of Elijah. And this work would be done all the way up until the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. So this, does not, this prophecy did not just apply to John the Baptist. It applies to God's people throughout history, up until the close of history. Now, because of that, Elijah will come. What is the work of Elijah? Well, it says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come. And what's Elias going to do? restore all things. So if the home is broken, then what do you think God wants us to do? Restore it. But the question is, when do we do this effort to restore the home? The restoration and uplifting of humanity begins in the home. This is to be our focus. So we got some work to do. We got some work to do, family. Because again, some of us as husbands, you might want to go to your wife today. And you might want to say, honey, dear, sweetheart, whatever terms of endearment you like to use, you might want to ask. And ladies, be lovingly honest with your husband. Don't be an actor. But I think every husband in this room should ask their wives, how am I helping make heaven more secure for you? And let her answer. 
Because your wives, as long as your wives love you, they're not going to say anything to hurt you. You wouldn't do that. If you love your husband, you would not say anything to hurt him. You build your man up. But it's important because that's the criterion for marriage is how can I make heaven more sure for you? Am I, how am I doing with that? My wife and I just went away on our anniversary, 26 years. And we laugh about it because we actually are like, you know, I actually love you. And not only that, I actually like you. And, and we, we, we laugh at it and stuff because we know, we do a lot of counseling. We know there's a lot of people that love their husbands, but they don't like them anymore. There's this brokenness. So we were kind of relishing in that. So at one point, we went on the beach together. And when we went on the beach, beautiful scenes of nature, quiet, private little spot. And we asked each other that question. How, how, how can I make heaven more sure for you? And we were able to share with each other of not only affirming each other in what we're already doing, but also saying, hey, here's things that you can consider doing that can make heaven more sure for me. Tomorrow's Father's Day. And because of Father's Day, I'm, I'm going to have the privilege of being with my gang, whom I love dearly, more than my own life. But I want to know, how can I make heaven more sure for you guys? How can I make heaven more sure for you girls? Because for me, that's the object of life. Everything else is a bonus. Making money, that's a bonus. You know, notoriety, recognition or whatever, that's, that's all bonuses. But the duty of life, how can I make heaven more sure for you? What is it that daddy could do? What is it that father could do? So when we talk about now, what should we do? The Bible's very clear, right? Redeem the time. You can't rewind time, but you can redeem time. What does redeem mean? Redeem means to rescue from loss. Improve your opportunities. Improve your opportunities from this point forward. How can I improve my opportunities to make sure from this day forward, I'm gonna make heaven more sure for my wife, for my husband, and for our children, and for my mom and for my dad. How are we going to do that? Even as siblings, as siblings, do you know you're supposed to hold each other accountable? You see your brother slipping, build him up. You see your sister slipping, build her up. We are called to reflect the image of God in our homes. And I know that sometimes we haven't paid attention to it, but there is a question God is going to ask every father, every mother, every husband, every wife. There's a question God is going to ask. We need to make sure we have good answers. Here's the question. Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee? Thy beautiful flock. God's going to ask every mother. God's going to ask every father. God is going to ask every teacher. God is going to ask every minister, where's the flock that I gave you? I gave you a flock. That's why it's a fearful thing to be a pastor of a church. It's a fearful thing to be an elder because you are overseers. According to Acts chapter 20, you are overseers of the flock. That term, SDA Bible Commentary, volume 4, page 412, the same searching question is directed at parents teachers, and spiritual leaders. God has entrusted precious souls to their care. He will require a strict account of those who are guardians of his flock. And there are some of us who I understand. We're pretty much at the close of our message for today. There are many of us who have flocks, especially talking to the parents in the room, some of us are parents and, you know, we, we did whatever we did, whether it was riddled with failure or successes or both. And some of our children are grown or older and making their own decisions. And sometimes the decisions can bring heartache because we say that's not what we expected. That's not what we labored for. And there are a lot of us as parents today that may have children that are wayward no longer following God, no longer keeping the Sabbath, no longer following present truth, no longer believing in Jesus, studying their Bibles, praying, doing things of the world, reflecting the world. God says, let not your heart be troubled. God says, you focus on redeeming the time. 
God says, let me focus on the other part. You know why? I leave you with some good news. Promises to parents for their wayward children, children that are veering away. You see the spirituality dying. You know, us parents, we got keen eyes and hearts. If we're connected with our children, we can see when they're spiritually dying out. We can see things are not like how it was supposed to be. Things are not the same, etc. We can see the, de de the declining. Well, here's some encouraging words God says. I remember there was a quote that was shared with me. I thought I had it here. Nope. And there's a quote that was popular in Adventism. It was a quote shared, you shared it with me one time, about the children. You remember that quote? I'm going to let you know this, okay? I loved that quote when I got it. I said, wow, God's going to bring our children back. And you know what I did next? I said, I'm going to put that in a slide. And I went to the writings and typed in the quote and couldn't find it. I looked more and couldn't find it. I'm a very well-connected man. And I got in touch with some of my top resources for Hebrew, Greek, Ellen White writings and the rest. And I went to my top people and said, hey, I'm trying to find this quote. Can you help me find this quote? And you know what they did? They said, it's non-existent. Can you, you know what, can you pass that quote up? Like, pa pass it up for me. Have one of the children or somebody. I I'm gonna read this quote to you. I came across this quote, family, and I remember I rejoiced with all my heart. Thank you so much for this. Bless you, yep, okay. So, it says, Review and Herald 1890, it says, the last mediatorial work of Christ before laying aside his priestly robes is to present the prayers of parents for their children. I saw a mighty angel sent out and thousands of children will remember their early training and be brought back just before probation closes. So I was looking everywhere for this quote, and nobody could find it. So I said, last resort, I have a friend, Larry Cruz, who works at the Ellen White estate. And Larry's always been my guy for getting resources. And I contacted him and I said, brother, I'm trying to find this quote. Where is it? And he said, Brother Lemon, I'm so sorry to tell you, this quote does not exist. And I said, what? And you can imagine how I'm feeling. I'm feeling a little crushed because the quote is so comforting, isn't it? But the truth is, Mrs. White never said this. I looked everywhere and couldn't find it. But because we're messengers of hope, he said, let not your heart be troubled, because here are some quotes that are verified, and they bring out the similar sentiment, and these we can hold to. I'm so glad I'm about to put on the screen these quotes. So if ever there was a time for you to get your camera out, this is your time. Number one, and this is a very solemn one here. This is from Manuscript 151, 1897, also Child Guidance 172. It says, if parents would see a different state of things in their family, let them consecrate themselves wholly to God, and the Lord will devise ways and means whereby a transformation may take place in their households. Family, maybe you're not as safe as you thought. 
One thing I have learned is don't ask your children to do something you are not willing to do. If you're not willing to surrender all to Christ, including bad tempers, bad attitudes, backbiting, evil surmising, even to your spouse, if you're not willing to surrender that, it is wrong to expect your children to surrender their lives. The quote is a conditional quote. If parents want to see a different state of things in their family, let them consecrate themselves wholly to God. Ask yourself, Lord, where is it that I still have not surrendered to you? Where is it? What's going on in my attitude? 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. Remember, the Lord looks on the heart. Where is it in my heart? Oh, yes, I look very put together on the external. I got a good diet. I practice dress reform. I live out in the country, and I have worship every morning and every evening. You look holy. But God is like, I see you. God says, I see something you don't see. You know what I've learned in driving? You can see a lot, but you could miss the blind spot. And when you miss a blind spot, it not only threatens your life, it threatens other people's lives. Ask yourself, family, Lord, what's my blind spot? Where is it that I'm not surrendered to you. Where's the bitterness, the anger, the resentment, the unforgiveness? What is it that I have yet to allow you to have control even over that? So please do not read this too quickly, beloved. Please don't do that. Ask yourself, Lord, where is it that I am not wholly consecrated? Where is it that I'm not fully surrendered? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any, any wicked way in me. And if there is, Lord, please, lead me in the way everlasting. That's promise number one. Promise number two, I like this, promise number two. Volume six of the Testimonies, page 400, paragraph three. When the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. Don't dumb down the truth even if your children are becoming worldly. Don't do that because they need to hear it. Think about it. If the children are becoming worldly, they have worldly friends. More than likely, none of them are keeping each other strong in the Lord. So what parents often do is we begin to dumb down our religion to accommodate their spiritual decline. Don't do that you're probably the only voice of reason that still they can hear. You make sure, lovingly, wisely, drop the seed when you can. But family, make sure that you keep the truths in front of them, the present truth, not just simply, you know, these concepts of love that sometimes is a perversion, but make sure you're keeping the present truth before them. Keep it before them when it's appropriate. Watch for the timing, but keep it before them. Because when the storm of persecution really breaks, many of the children are going to remember and say, oh, wait a minute, mom and dad did, yes, mom and dad, what must I do to be saved? And many children will be saved. So don't dumb down your religion because the children have dumbed down their religion. Don't do that. You keep that standard high and ask God for wisdom. James 1, 5, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, God will give it liberally. Ask him for wisdom. Lord, how do I keep the present truth before my family? Now that I'm watching spiritual decline, God will give you wisdom. But don't dumb down the truth, because when the storm of persecution breaks, there's going to be many who's going to turn to the Lord. Last two quotes. This one is from Christ Object Lessons, page 202, paragraph 1. The love of God still yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from him. And he sets in operation, that's good news. He sets in operation influences to bring him back to the Father's house. A golden chain, the mercy and compassion of divine love is passed around every imperiled soul. When we're sleeping, God is working. When they're over in another state or another country, God is there. And what is he doing? He's setting in operation influences 
to bring them back to the father's house. I'm telling you the truth. This is what allows an anxious parent to go to sleep at night and get good sleep. This is what allows us. Even if you heard, oh, my children are at the club. Lord, I remember what happened in clubs. That's when we could say, all right, father, I commit my son. Call him out by name. I commit my daughters. Call him out by name. Lord, I commit them in your hands. Set in operation, as you promised, influences to bring them back to the father's house. Last quote. In heavenly places, page 10, paragraph 5. Heaven is waiting and yearning for the return of the prodigals. We should too, who have wandered far from the fold. It says many of those who have strayed away may be brought back by the loving service of God's children. We are living in the time where we need to redeem the time. And God wants you to know that he's on your side. He loves you with an everlasting love. Even if our homes are hell on earth, he could turn it into heaven on earth. God says, I can do it. But all he needs, I've learned a long time ago, the, the, the balance of what makes God's plan work is hinged in one word, cooperation. You got to cooperate with God. If you don't cooperate with him, though he has all power, it won't work on our behalf. And I believe that a lot of us have not been cooperating with God. The Bible says that every fight that we have, somebody's being proud. That's Proverbs 13 and verse 10. Only by pride comes fighting. So every fight a husband and wife is having, somebody's being proud. Early writings, page 19, if pride and selfishness were removed, five minutes would solve most difficulties. Five minutes if pride and selfishness could be removed. This is why we need Jesus. This is why we cannot have a marriage, we cannot have a home without Christ. We need him. We need him to be ever so central in our home, in our thoughts. And beloved, it doesn't matter what mistakes you made. It doesn't matter where you are in your marriage and in your home. The power of the Lord is present to heal. And so my question is this. While I won't expose what we're going through, like, you know, if you want your home to be better, please stand up. I won't do that. But what I'm simply going to ask is this question. How many of us understood the message today? Did you understand what God is communicating? Then I want us to stand together. We're going to close with prayer. But I want you to make the personal covenants in your heart. And on this beautiful Sabbath day, go find a tree to be under and in the shade and have a picnic. Go somewhere in the homes. Get some time, family, to just kind of say, you know what? We need to talk. And let's see how the Lord can bring even more healing. It's hard to stay faithful in these last days. Thank God it's possible, but it's hard. Then the enemy hath done this. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Let us remember this and let us go forward in victory. Let's stand together as we close with prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for what you have shared with us today. We thank you for the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, dear God, for showing us that though the home is under attack, you have a plan to help us redeem the time. And Lord, I pray that you will help all of us that as a result of hearing you speak to our hearts, that we will cooperate better with your spirit and truly only do that which will make heaven more secure for our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, and our siblings, and help us to finally experience that oneness that you said in the prayer of John 17. This is our prayer we ask, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. amen.